the updated schedule. If you pull this up and you scroll down, you can see that we're right here. So this is today for the bone section or the bone chapter, chapter six. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to read all of the portions of the chapter that we're not going to cover in lecture. So you can see over here, our lecture is going to cover 6.3, 6.7, 6.8, and 6.10. So as I go through the PowerPoint today, these are the sections of the book that are actually going to be in the PowerPoint that I am using for the Zoom meeting. And then you will see another PowerPoint that is listed on modules that has the full entire chapter. So you can use that PowerPoint if you want to kind of go through and have some notes to look at while you are reading that chapter, or you can use the dynamic study modules on Pearson, whatever you prefer. So we're gonna do these sections of chapter six today. Today is gonna to be the last lecture because moving forward when it comes to chapter 10, for the muscles, you guys are gonna watch the posted videos that are gonna to correlate to each section of the lecture PowerPoint that is within the modules. And I'll show you that here in just a second. And then the very last week is finals week. So this is where you will do test four. Test four is not cumulative. So it's just gonna cover chapter six and chapter 10. Yes, you do have to take it because it is gonna be the uh, other 17.5% remaining for your grade. It will be open online from Monday, December 7th to Thursday, December the 10th. And there is no paper portion, no written portion. So you do not need to look for that. It is a pulled exam, which means that there are 75 questions from chapter six, 75 questions from chapter 10, and you will get a total of 50 questions for your exam at home. So just make sure that you do take it at any point in time within this time frame that it is open. It is a timed exam. So do make sure that your computer is charged and you are ready to take it because once you start, you will have to finish it. So, as we look through the modules, what you will see for that muscle, since I'm not going to be doing the lecturing, you guys have access to all of this information now. So you can utilize the information at any point in time, whether that's over Thanksgiving break, whether you want to start it now, it's really totally up to you on what you want to do. But you will see here that there is a lecture PowerPoint and each lecture PowerPoint section has an associated video with it. So they are in order. So you'll start with the skeletal muscle structure in the PowerPoint presentation. And if you're not sure about any of the material, you can go to the video and watch the video to get greater clarity of that information. And then you just keep continue to go on down. So you've got the myofibril structure, the neuromuscular junction, the events at the cholinergic or the neuromuscular junction, excitation and coupling, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these videos cover all of the sections of this lecture PowerPoint right here. So since this is learning on your own time, class time is gonna be reserved for any questions that you may have about anything from chapter six or from chapter 10. For chapter six or chapter 10, since those are the two chapters that are on test four, if you have any questions about any of that, then that's whenever you would come and ask them during your class period, since I will not be lecturing during the muscles week. So I'll just be answering questions, um, helping you walk, work through any of the material that you don't quite understand. Okay, so everybody okay with that? We're good? All right, so let's go into our PowerPoint for today. Okay, so again, this is only gonna cover a small portion of the chapter, so make sure that you do look over the other sections or do the dynamic study modules for those particular sections that we're not talking about. So when we're looking at bone, bone tissue is a very dense, supportive, connective tissue with very specialized cells. As we look at bone, a lot of times people think about um, skeletons in a casket and they think dead, not alive, and that is the exact opposite of what I want you guys to think about, okay? Because they are very much alive and there is a lot of activity that's gonna be occurring inside of the bone. 
Inside of the bone, we will find a solid extracellular matrix with collagen fibers. Remember, collagen is that very tough fiber. So about one third of the bone mass is actually collagen fibers, which is stronger than steel. So bones are very, very strong. And then they also have a very dense matrix due to deposits of calcium salts. So if you do not remember what is an extracellular matrix, this is your reminder. It's that non-cellular component within various tissues that will provide the physical properties for the cellular constituents and it allows the necessary biochemical and, or excuse me, that should not be in there, biochemical processes within a tissue, okay? Uh, oh, biochemical and biomechanical, can't read today. So whenever we're talking about the extracellular matrix, that was something that we learned at the very beginning of the semester, whenever you were looking at the tissues underneath the microscope, you basically saw there was a lot of cells inside of the epithelial tissues. And then inside of the connective tissues, you saw things that were very characteristic of an extracellular matrix, which defined various tissues. So bone does not look the same as blood, which does not look the same as fibrocartilage. Okay, so that's your extracellular matrix. That's what you were looking at underneath the microscope. For our matrix, consists of calcium phosphate. This will make up almost two thirds of that bone mass. This will interact with calcium hydroxide to form crystals of what are called hydroxyapatite. And this will help incorporate other calcium salts like calcium carbonate and ions. And then when we combine those crystals and the collagen fibers, this is what allows the bone to be very strong, but then also flexible and resistant to compression. A bone lacking a calcified matrix looks normal, but it is very flexible as what you see over here on this picture. So it looks like it would be the same if it was laying down next to this other bone, but because it doesn't have that solid matrix that is necessary for bones, this is why you have that flexibility that you see in this picture over here. That's not what we want. We do want something very strong to help support the weight of our body. So when we're looking at bones, some of the characteristics you wanna make sure that you recall, because we have learned some of this stuff in the past with the tissues portion of lab especially. So we know we have osteocytes, which are bone cells, and they live inside of these structures called the lacunae. So you can see that over here, the lacunae contain the osteocytes. And these are gonna be organized around blood vessels. So just remember the blood vessels are gonna be at the center of an osteon. They'll run through the central canal, also called the Haversian canal, that's an AKA. And then we have the canaliculi, which are basically these channels that allow the passage of nutrients, waste and gases from that central canal out towards the periphery of the osteon. We also have cell to cell communication that can occur through these channels. So those canaliculi are very important. So that way we can get plenty of nourishment throughout this bone. And then the periosteum, another reminder, remember this covers the outer surface of the bones, except at the joints. It's not gonna occur at the joints because we have hyaline cartilage at the joints. And this will consist of an outer fibrous and an inner cellular layer. You can see in this picture here that I've got the periosteum layer of the bone. You can see it's interconnected and intertwined very intensely with this tendon, which is the structure that will attach muscle to bone. So very important structure because not only does it surround the bone, but it also helps form that attachment site where you have your muscles that are gonna help move your bones. For our bone cells, we wanna know these four different types, okay? You can see pictures of them here and we're gonna walk through them one by one, but these bone cells make up only 2% of the bone mass, although they're incredibly important. So for our osteogenic cells, we're gonna start off with these and AKA is osteoprogenitor cells. These are mesenchymal cells that will divide to produce osteoblast. So these are the stem cells. Okay, the osteogenic cells are very important because these stem cells will allow a continuation of bone development throughout our entire life. So you may think that, well, once we 
have our bones developed as an adult, then that's it. They are what they are, but that's actually not true. They are going to be remodeled throughout the process of your life. We'll be talking about that in a minute. So we do want to make sure we have these stem cells that can continue to provide us with these osteoblasts. Okay. They are located in the inner cellular layer of that periosteum as well as in the endosteum and they will star 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 assist in fracture repair. So they will help with making sure that we have the cells that we need in order to repair any bones that have been broken. So since these stem cells will help produce the osteoblasts, the question is what do osteoblasts do? So osteoblasts are going to be the cells that help build bone. So when you see the B in blast, think B for build, blast build. So we have these immature cells that will produce new bone matrix during a process called osteogenesis. So genesis means creation, like the first book of the Bible is Genesis. So creation, osteo, bone. So creation of bone. This is going to come from our osteoblast. This can also be called ossification. Okay, so the osteoid is the matrix produced by the osteoblast that has not yet become calcified, but the osteoblast will help trigger the deposition of the calcium salts into the matrix so that that bone can harden and become very strong. Osteoblasts surrounded by bone matrix will eventually become osteocytes. So that's a different type of cell. Okay, so blasts are gonna build it up. And then we have sites. These are our mature bone cells. They are going to live inside of these lacunae, like you can see right here, the osteocyte inside of the lacunae. And these are going to help maintain the bone. So the blast will build and then the sites will help maintain. So they maintain the protein and the mineral content of the matrix. So this is kind of like the difference between um, the construction crew that will come and build up a building versus the crew that is going to help run and take care of the building. Okay, two different sets of people, two different sets of cells inside of the bone. These will also help in the repair of damaged bone. So it is possible for these osteocytes to leave the lacunae and then become an osteoblast or even that stem cell, that osteogenic cell in order to help heal fractures. Again, depending upon what the bone needs in order to help maintain homeostasis and to allow for any repair processes that need to occur, that can happen. So the osteocytes do ultimately help maintain this bone. And then we have osteoclasts. So the C in class, I want you to think about the C in clean. So osteoclasts clean. So blast build, sites maintain, and class clean. What the osteoclasts are going to do is they're actually going to absorb and remove the bone matrix. They are going to secrete these acids and then protein digesting enzymes that will help dissolve the bone matrix. And whenever this occurs, this will also release some stored minerals. And this we call osteolysis. This is very important in homeostasis because of the process of rebuilding. So whenever we are cleaning up old dead bone, we can replace it with new healthy bone to make sure that our bones are always strong and sufficient. Now, if we have the activity of osteoclast exceeding any activity of osteoblast, what do you guys think that this is going to do to the bone? How is that bone going to be affected if there's more osteoclast activity than osteoblast activity? What do you guys think? Like eat at the bone. What's that? Like eat at the bone. Yeah, it would like eat at the bone, right? And make the bone weaker. Exactly. So. That's exactly right. The osteoclasts, if they're really, really, really busy and the osteoblasts aren't doing their job, then the bones are going to be broken down more and they will become weaker. Okay. Interesting thing about these cells is that they are not related to osteogenic cells, which is 
really interesting and unique whenever you think about their called osteoclast. You would think that they come from the stem cells, but instead they're actually derived from the same cells that will produce monocytes and macrophages, which are part of our immune system and help do cleanup properties in all parts of the body to keep us well. So that's where these osteoclasts actually come from. Now, when we're talking about bone remodeling, as I said a couple of times already, this is going to occur throughout your life. So most of your skeleton is actually replaced about every 10 years. There's different parts of the skeleton that are gonna be replaced quicker than others. Some parts take longer, um, but all in all, bone remodeling is a process that's constantly occurring. And this will help to function in bone maintenance by recycling and renewing that bone matrix to keep it healthy and strong and well. It involves all of those cells that we talked about, the osteocytes, the osteoblast, and the osteoclast. And of course, as homeostasis says, we want everything to be in balance. So normally these activities are balanced, but if you do have removal faster than replacement, like we just said earlier, the bone will weaken. If you have deposition that is predominating, then the bone will strengthen. So if the blasts are working harder than the class, then the bones are gonna become stronger, okay? If you also exercise, then we're gonna talk about that in a second as well, because that will stimulate the blast to help you with bone deposition. If you have um, more of the class three leg going, is that also part of osteoporosis? Yes, yes, and we are gonna get there. Good question. Okay, so when we're talking about exercise, effects of exercise on bone are very widespread. Of course, we know exercise is incredibly important in order to maintain our health. So a lot of people don't always recognize that the exercise is not just important for your heart or for your muscles, but it's also important for your bones. So mineral recycling allows the bones to adapt to stress and heavily stressed bones become thicker and stronger. This is Wolf's Law. So your fill in the blank is Wolf, W-O-L-F. I think this is actually two Fs, W-O-L-F-F. -F. Wolf's Law says that whenever you put increased pressure on a bone, then that is going to cause that bone to undergo a greater amount of stress, which is going to cause the blast to work harder, so it will build more bone. So whenever you lift weights, you're actually going to be putting that stress on your bone in a good way, and then your bone is going to build up, okay? This is why generally people who are overweight also have thicker bones as well than people who are very thin frame. Also, like I said, we're gonna talk about osteoporosis in a minute, but that's one of the reasons why people who are thinner are more likely to have osteoporosis. So that is one thing that we do have to be cautious of as people are getting into the geriatric age. If you have a thinner female who is very low body weight and you do have to take into consideration that is going to be very different for her bones than someone who is much greater in the weight area, okay? So we do want to stimulate those osteoblasts in order to keep our bones strong. Both weight bearing and muscle strengthening exercises will allow them to strengthen over time. So we have different forms of weight bearing exercises, which include walking, running, dancing, climbing stairs, using an elliptical. But if we're gonna do muscle strengthening exercises, this doesn't just increase our muscle mass, it will also help with our bone mass. So things like lifting weights, using the elastic exercise bands, swimming, which is one of my favorites, push-ups, which is one of my least favorites, but I still have to do it, and squats, which I don't like doing squats, but I like the effects of squats. So um, all of these exercises are all really great to help. Now, whenever we're talking about someone who maybe doesn't feel like they have the capacity to exercise, either because of age or because of ill health, you know, there are things that can be done to help kind of get around these things, um, but at least starting in something, even if it's just that light walking is very important for overall homeostasis and health. So even if somebody feels like, well, I can't squat and my knees hurt and, you know, they have all of these other reasons of why they can't do something, whatever you can do, even if it's going to the gym to work out with the people who do water aerobics, so that way there's not a lot of 
um, a heavy gravity on your joints and it will be a little bit easier, that is still better than nothing. Okay, so bone will degenerate quickly. You can lose up to one third. This is, this is crazy and mind blowing to me. Up to one third of your bone mass can be lost in a few weeks of inactivity. It's just crazy. So this is why regular exercise is very vital to maintaining that bone mass and strength. Because if you're down for just a few weeks, either you're not making time to go to the gym, or let's say maybe you had a fracture, um, you're gonna lose bone mass. So you wanna do try to come back from those levels of inactivity and increase. Yes, sir. All right, inactive, that's an obvious question to answer. Inactivity being just sitting around doing nothing. Yep, sitting around doing nothing couch potato, sedentary lifestyle. You work at a desk, you're there from eight to five, you don't get up and move around except for when it's time for you to go to lunch and at lunch you sit down for your 30, 45 minute lunch break and you go home and you sit down. So basically that is inactivity. Yes, you are moving around and yes, you're going to work and yes, you're using your brain, but you are very inactive. That's a very sedentary lifestyle. So that will cause your bones to lose their mass. Okay, so whenever we talk about exercise, of course, right after that, we have to talk about diet as well, because um, of course you don't wanna just exercise and then eat a whole bunch of crap. So we do have nutritional effects on bone. So you can see that I've put some of the important things over here, different vitamins and minerals are going to be required. Of course, calcium is huge whenever it comes to bones. Um, we'll be talking more about calcium here in just a second, but it's not the only one and it cer certainly does not work alone. So there are multiple things that you're going to want to get into your diet on a regular basis in order to help with the homeostasis of your bones. Now calcitriol and vitamin D3 are of course very important as well. Calcitriol is made in the kidneys and this is going to be essential to help calcium and phosphate ion absorption in the GI tract. So the vitamin D intake will help with increasing the calcium absorption from these foods that you eat. So if you're eating these sardines and these dark green leafy vegetables, um, you are going to have a better chance of absorbing that if your vitamin D levels are sufficient. If your vitamin D levels are not sufficient, then you might have a little bit more problem absorbing that. So it's very important to have all of the uh, key players working together. Now, all of the minerals, as we talk about minerals like zinc, copper, et cetera, they have to maintain a balanced ratio. So an example of that is if we have too much phosphorus, then can, this can cause calcium to be excreted from the bones. And of course, it will be, be very harmful to the kidneys as well. So although that is going to be an important mineral, too much of it is going to cause a problem. Can you guys think of something that is high in phosphorus that is so common and basically consumed every single day in America? Processed foods. What'd you say? Processed foods. Processed foods, yeah. Um, but there's one that's even higher and like so many people drink it every coffee. day. Not coffee. Soda. Energy Soda. So a lot of sodas are really high in phosphorus, okay? So if you ever hear people say, oh, well, I just have a soda a day. Okay, soda a day <laughs> definitely does not keep the doctor away. Um, it is going to cause you long-term impacts because it can leach calcium from your bones and then it can start causing kidney issues. So in um, my particular case, because I grew up eating really crappy food all of my life, I really can't drink soda at all without getting back pain. Because as soon as I drink soda, my kidneys immediately just go to hurting. So I just don't even drink soda. Um, it's just not worth it to me anymore. But that high phosphorus level, plus I'm a very thin female, thin white female, which puts me high on the list of more likely to get osteoporosis. I don't wanna do anything that's going to leak calcium out of my bones. But then also whenever my husband told me that he could pour soda on like a rusty battery inside of the car or some, some situation like that, and like it would clean it up. And when he showed me that visually, I was like, oh, what is that doing to my insides? 
So we do not buy soda ever since that little that garage experiment that my husband showed me. So I do appreciate that, learning that, because I don't know anything about cars. All right, so all of these are very important. This is why it's also important to have a wide variety of foods. Don't just eat the same foods every single day. Eating the same foods every single day doesn't provide a spectrum of vitamins and minerals. So you do want to try to eat all the colors of the rainbow, but then you also want to keep a good variety. If every single uh, Friday you eat the same thing, every single Monday you eat the same thing, it's time to change it up and get some different things going on. So the class is getting me in trouble. We were talking about this, me and my wife today, because she takes supplements. Yeah. Right? And my mom's in town. We went to get her. And we were just talking about how much is too much. And my wife was like, there's no such thing as too much supplement. Okay. That's not true. Okay. That's a very good question. So you want me to address that? Please. Okay. <laughs> so hopefully this was... Is this being recorded? Yes. <laughs> yes. Hopefully this won't get you in further trouble. But here's the thing. Um, in just a second, whenever I talk about calcium and how it maintains homeostasis, I'm actually going to show you guys the brand of supplements that I use in practice. And the reason why I only will use these is because they're made from foods. So if you look at your supplement bottle, if you go home tonight and you look at all of her stuff, you turn it around on the back and what you wanna look at is two things. Number one, you wanna look at if there is a, um, a vitamin or a mineral listed there and then you see parentheses afterwards, like let's say vitamin C, parentheses as ascorbic acid, okay? Uh, vitamin A as, vitamin E as. If you see all these parentheses as, parentheses as, then that is a synthetic form of the vitamin, okay? Then if you look over to the daily value percentage, it will say daily value 100%, 150%, 500%, things like that don't occur in nature. So whenever you're looking at your vitamins, you shouldn't have all of those parentheses because that, if you do, then that means that they are man-made in a lab, okay? Um, so if it's whole foods, it's going to actually list out broccoli, asparagus, carrots, spirulina, bok choy. You should see words that you could actually go to the grocery store and buy those ingredients, okay? Not as this chemical, okay? So this isn't going to taste good, in other words, when I get these. It, you said, is it going to taste it's good? It's not going to taste good. Oh, you know, it's probably not going to taste good, but you can also just swallow it. You don't have to chew it. So there's whiskey. Huh? Uh, well, there's alcohol. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's your other way to know um, whether it's in parentheses as something or whether it's a high daily value percentage. So like on the whole food vitamins, you're probably not going to see anything that says 500 percent, 1000 percent, because that's not nature. Okay, that's man-made, laboratory, manipulated vitamins. You're generally going to pay more for whole food vitamins because they actually have to grow the food and then do a process to where they will blend the food down and put it in the supplement. So there's a whole lot more that goes into that rather than somebody just in there mixing up chemicals and pushing it into a pill. So that's why there's some vitamins that you can see they're $4.99. And then there's this one brand that I'm not even going to say what it is, but they're always buy one, get one free. Because yeah. it's like, Nature made in the mouth. yeah, so that means that <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that, you do get what you pay for. Okay, so you do want to be very cautious and read your labels because the questions become like your question, how much is too much? Well, whenever the body is basically taking in tons of chemicals that can it cannot recognize because you're just overwhelming it with all of these products you're either going to cause some issues maybe in your liver because your liver has to filter everything out or you're just going to pee it out and you're wasting your money anyways so your body may be able to get rid of it but some of the stuff like sometimes even calcium will start to build up in other places, which is why you hear some people say, oh, I can't take calcium supplements because I'm prone to kidney stones, or, oh, I have arthritis, I can't take calcium supplements because I don't want the crystals depositing in my joints. So there is, yes, a level of too much whenever it is the synthetic man-made. If you're taking whole food varieties, 
you're not going to run into that because your body's like, oh, broccoli, yes, we'll take that over here. It's totally different, two different things. So it's comparing apples to oranges whenever you're looking at whole food supplements versus this is cheap. Let me just get this because I don't have enough of this in my diet. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense and it helps me out a lot. Okay, so that being said, um, whenever we get into 2402, the other thing that goes into that is, of course, malabsorption. So you also have to be cognizant of that person's ability to absorb their vitamins as well. And that comes with how well is your GI tract working. So that is a whole different topic for a whole different semester. <laughs> so it gets greater later is, yeah. is, is what I'm trying to say. All right. So whenever you are, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at all of these things, um, make sure, again, like I said, diversify. Try to get a number of different things. Don't just eat the same thing every single day. I do encourage my patients, try a new food a week. Every week, try something new. And if you're like, oh, I don't know what to cook, go to Whole Foods. And even if you don't buy anything from there, because you maybe are like, I don't want to pay that much. The whole wall of produce is just inspirational. It's like, there is so many different things and you're like, oh, what's this? What's this? Oh, I could try this. So you really shouldn't never be in a food rut if you just know where to go to look for things. OK, so um, again, vitamin C, like we've talked about, important for the adrenal glands. We know it's important for the immune system. It's also required for collagen synthesis. So definitely important for the bones because the bones need that collagen in order to be stronger than steel. And of course, vitamin C will help with stimulating osteoblast differentiation. So will help build that bone. Vitamin A stimulates osteoblast activity as well. So incredibly important for the bones, just as important for the eyes to help you with um, vision at night. If you find that your vision is going down whenever you're trying to drive at nighttime, that could be very likely related to vitamin A deficiency. So you need to get those colorful veggies in your life ASAP, okay? Vitamins K and B12 are also required for synthesis of bone protein. So just more vitamins um, as we go through and talk about all of the important things that are necessary for our bone health. Now, in addition to vitamins and minerals, we also have hormonal effects on the bone. So growth hormone, abbreviated GH, this is going to stimulate protein synthesis, cell division, and cell growth. So as the name implies, growth hormone helps you grow. It targets your bones and it targets your muscles. It will make you grow taller if you have a pituitary tumor, because growth hormone comes from the pituitary. If you have a pituitary tumor, it could be possible for you to have more growth hormone being released into your system than you should, which would then cause you to be very, very tall, okay? Or the opposite, you'd be quite short if you don't have enough. So we have growth hormone from the pituitary. We have thyroxin from the thyroid. This also helps stimulate bone growth by increasing the osteoblast activity and cellular metabolism. And then we have sex hormones that are going to be released at the time of puberty. Estrogen for females, testosterone for males, they will both stimulate osteoblasts. And estrogen will cause the epiphyseal closure faster than testosterone, which is what causes women to usually be shorter than men. So what is epiphyseal closure? Well, we have this area in the bones at the ends of the bones called the epiphysis. This is the epiphyseal plate, also commonly called the growth plate. So you'll have it at both the proximal and the distal end of the bone. And whenever you are growing, this will cause the longitudinal growth of the diaphysis. So it causes your bone to get longer, okay? Whenever you are done growing, the epiphyseal plate will become an epiphyseal line. So lines show up on x-rays, and that tells us this person is done growing. Their epiphyseal plate has closed. They have an epiphyseal line. They are not going to get any taller. Okay, so lines signify that's it. This bone is not going to get any longer. Estrogen 
causes that plate to close sooner than testosterone. So that is where a lot of the height difference comes from men and women, okay? And then we also have parathyroid hormone, abbreviated PTH, and calcitonin, which will help us maintain our calcium ion homeostasis for the growth and development of this bone. So if you like charts, you can see here that all of the hormones are listed in this chart right here. It tells you where the hormone comes from and what is the effect on the skeletal system. For our calcium, this is incredibly important overall in the entire body. But what you will see here is that the bones store 99% of the body's calcium. So it's something like between two to five pounds worth of calcium inside of our body. So if you get on the scale and you weigh 150 pounds, then maybe about five pounds of that is calcium. Okay, which is really cool. So it's the most abundant mineral in the body because it's not only important for the bones, but it's also really important to things like the skeletal muscle contraction. And you guys are going to see that. Um, you guys are going to watch the videos that will show you where calcium is indeed necessary for skeletal muscle contraction. In 2402, we talk about how important calcium is for cardiac muscle. And so maintaining that heartbeat appropriately, incredibly important, of course, because we need that um, for homeostasis. So very, very important to have good amounts of calcium and to have high quality calcium. So as I said earlier, this is the company that I use. So Standard Process is all whole food supplements. They have been since they have been open over 100 years now. Um, all of their food is grown on an organic farm in Wisconsin. I've been out to the farm. I've seen how incredible these people are. The farmers really love their jobs. They take great care of the land. Um, so all of these little bottles that you see down here, these little brown bottles, are basically the things that I use in practice because this is all whole food based. Whenever we're looking at diet, of course, poor diet is going to affect calcium intake whether it's fast food, fad diets, um, not eating, uh, not absorbing, whatever it is, calcium is oftentimes low inside of the body. And we need to make sure that we have enough calcium in order to keep everything working appropriately. Now, the blood is so amazing in the fact that it will do whatever is necessary in order to keep blood calcium levels within homeostasis. It will take from the bone if it needs to because the blood does not want to have low calcium or it will put in the bone if it needs to because the blood does not want to have high calcium. So the blood is what I call bougie, okay? Blood is incredibly high maintenance and it is like, I just want it this way and this is the way it's going to be and I'm not going to accept it any other way or else we're going to have problems. So we're going to talk about how the blood will maintain calcium homeostasis, maintain calcium balance, but that means that it can then be affected negatively in other tissues like our bones, okay? So what you can see here is a picture of normal strong bone, and this is a picture of osteoporotic bone. So you can see here that these spaces are more open. They're actually more thin. So if you can look at the consistency here versus something here. So very weak, very thin, and it is important to not just take any calcium supplement because the calcium like carbonate, which is the most common one, um, honestly, I tell my patients, you might as well go lick the sidewalk because like that's about what you're getting with calcium carbonate. It's just there's so many um, steps that are required in biochemistry for the calcium carbonate to be broken down and then efficiently absorbed. And it's very hard for uh, many people to actually do that and utilize it appropriately. So this is why there are those studies that say, oh, calcium supplements contribute to kidney stones or to other problems in different parts of the body. And it's because that calcium just cannot be utilized like it should. Carbonate is a no. Um, if you look at lactate and citrate, those are easier for you to break down and to utilize. So in this particular instance, 
normally what I would recommend is the lactate because it's the easiest one for people to break down and it's more likely to be absorbed inside of the body. So everybody is different. Um, there's different things for different people, but you do not want to go without your calcium, especially if you are more prone or you fall into the category of more likely to develop skeletal issues. So let's talk about how this calcium is maintained within the blood. Parathyroid hormone and calcitonin are the two that you need to remember because they're the two that are gonna be working together in order to affect, as you can see here, storage, absorption, and excretion of the calcium ions. And these are the three target areas that they are gonna to go to in order to maintain blood calcium levels, okay? So our bones, our GI tract, and our kidneys are gonna be the three target areas that parathyroid hormone and calcitonin will work in order to maintain homeostasis in calcium ion regulation. Um, I'm not gonna play this video, but it is in the PowerPoint for you guys. If you wanna go back and watch it, I'm actually gonna go through the PowerPoint and explain it to you guys. So parathyroid hormone, the PTH, as you can see, it is going to be associated with the thyroid gland. So this is actually the posterior thyroid gland is where you would find the parathyroid glands. There's usually two on each side, so a total of four. You need to star, circle, highlight, whatever. Increases blood calcium, okay? This is what parathyroid hormone will do. It will increase the blood calcium. And by the way, we go through this again in 2402 when we talk about the endocrine system which is the very first chapter that's covered in 2402. And a lot of people get really confused in that chapter. So if you remember these two things now, then that's less for you to worry about later on. Okay, so increases blood calcium. And the key here is it's blood calcium, all right? Not tissue calcium, blood calcium. And the way it will do this is it can stimulate the osteoclast activity. Osteoclast, what do those cells do? Clean. clean, right? They're the cleanup crew. So osteoclasts are going to clean up. They can break down the bone. They can, uh, PTH can increase intestinal absorption of calcium by enhancing the calcitriol secretion by the kidneys. Remember calcitriol necessary to help you with calcium absorption in the, DI, in the GI tract. Or PTH can decrease calcium excretion by the kidneys. Calcitonin, on the other hand, is going to be an antagonist to parathyroid hormone. What is antagonist? Mean? Works against. Works against, right? So they're gonna do opposite things. So calcitonin is gonna be secreted by the C cells in the thyroid gland. So we're still in the thyroid. PTH is gonna come from the posterior thyroid. The C cells are going to come from the thyroid. This is gonna decrease blood calcium, okay? Decrease blood calcium. And the way it will do this is by inhibiting the cleanup crew. So we're gonna say, don't break down that bone because I don't want you to release any calcium into the bloodstream whenever you break that down. Or we can increase calcium excretion and reduce any calcitriol by the kidney. So we can say, let's pee out some more calcium if we need to decrease the blood calcium, or we can decrease the intestinal absorption of calcium. So as we look at this little picture here, this will show you we've got these three responses that are going to be triggered if we have low calcium ion levels in the blood. So anything below 8.5 milligrams per deciliter. If you are not eating the calcium rich foods, you don't take a calcium supplement, you don't have the ability to have an intestinal response with more calcium absorption, then we're gonna go to the bone, okay? We're gonna go to the bone and we're gonna say, hey, cleanup crew, can you start breaking down this bone so that we can release these calcium from the bone? Yes, I know it's gonna make the bone weaker, but right now it's more important to the blood for all of the other processes that have to occur 
with calcium, we need that calcium out of the bone. So we don't care that it's going to make it weak. We need it right now. Okay, that's what the blood is going to say. Or we are going to have the kidneys that are going to absorb calcium ions. But again, calcitriol is important in this little component. And if you have low vitamin D, then you may have some issues here as well. Okay, so this is why it's easy to end up with something like osteopenia or osteoporosis if you do not have the calcium or vitamin D that your body needs. Ultimately, any of these three choices are options for the parathyroid hormone to act upon in order to ultimately increase the calcium level in the blood. And if we have too much, so let's say we don't want anything above 11. So you can see that's a very tight range, 8.5 to 11. I told you guys the blood is bougie. It's like 8.5 to 11, that's the only thing I'm dealing with here, all right? So if you have high calcium ion levels in the blood, let's say because you're either taking a whole lot of calcium supplements or you're eating a ton of calcium rich foods, whatever it is, um, the blood does not want a whole lot of excess. So it will tell the thyroid glands, hey, C cells, I need you guys to secrete the hormone calcitonin, and then calcitonin will go to work again in these same three areas. So if you are eating a lot of that, um, again, intestinal absorption of the calcium will decrease or you'll pee it out. So taking a super huge amount of calcium in a synthetic supplement every day, you're either not going to absorb it or you're going to pee it out, okay? Because the body is like, mm, I don't need all that. Or what can happen over here in the bone response, the osteoclast activity will decrease. Unfortunately, look at this right here, osteoblast activity unaffected. So it's like, wait, hold up. Normally you would think, well, if you have too much calcium, let's go ahead and deposit it into the bones. But according to what the researchers have seen is that the osteoblast activity does not change even with high levels of calcium. So again, you're back to peeing it out or uh, decreasing the absorption rate of it. Yes, ma'am. So the blood is going to dictate which one is secreted. Say it again. The blood will dictate which one is secreted. So it, does, it like the blood flows through whatever, and it would go to either the parathyroid or and like tell it like, hey, do yep. this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. The blood levels of the calcium will dictate which player gets to come into the game. Okay. In order to maintain homeostasis between that eight and a half to eleven. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So if we don't have enough calcium in our life, we're either not eating the right foods, we're not taking the right supplements, whatever the case may be, um, then we are going to be more prone to getting either osteopenia or osteoporosis. Now, osteopenia is the steps before osteoporosis. So osteopenia is whenever your bones start to have less density than they should. And the way we look at this is through a bone scan called a DEXA scan. So the bone density is going to be measured on what's called a T-score. Normal bone density, you can see plus one to negative one. If you start to have low bone density, negative one to negative 2.5, this is osteopenia. This is whenever you get the um, information from your doctor to say, hey, your bones are not looking so great and there needs to be some changes in your life. You need to, what do they always say? Diet and exercise, diet and exercise. Those are the always, always the two answers to everything. Unfortunately, not everybody knows what that means, right? As a patient, you're like, well, what am I supposed to do? Um, so diet and exercise, of course, eating the good healthy foods, putting the stress on your bones to go along with Wolf's Law, all of those things are gonna be very important to help with your bone density. If it is negative 2.5 or higher, at risk for osteoporosis. If we look at these pictures here, so let's look at this one down here first. Normal bone, osteopenia, you can see that things are starting to look slightly different, not a whole lot, but if you look really close, there's gonna be more spacing in between these areas of the bone. 
versus osteoporosis. I mean, you can clearly see that there's a major difference between this and normal bone and then severe osteoarthritis would look like this. So looks very similar to um, the osteoporosis. Now remember osteoarthritis is going to be inflammation of the articular areas of the bone. So whether that's rheumatoid um, arthritis, that's something different, that's actually an autoimmune disease. Um, osteoarthritis is something that is a quote unquote degenerative process. It occurs over time unless it's a situation where it's post-traumatic osteoarthritis. You've been in a major car accident, you've broken bones, and then whenever they try to heal back up, now you've lost cartilage and now you have post-traumatic osteoarthritis, okay? So you can see a different view from it here as well, from the spine, normal bone versus osteoporotic bone. So if you want more information about ways to actually help, or if you know someone who has osteopenia or osteoporosis, and they're wanting to know, well, how can I actually help my bone density? Because there are a lot of females um, who are more prone, again, white, thin females are more prone to osteoporosis um, than other um, ethnicities. So whenever you are talking to people that you love, you can refer them to this article right here because this goes beyond the, oh, let's just take this um, prescription like Fosamax or Boniva. Um, what those um, drugs do is they actually target the osteoclast to stop working. So whenever they target the osteoclast to stop working, what we know from homeostasis, if you affect one thing, you're going to negatively impact another. So if we stop the osteoclast from working, although it sounds in theory like a good idea, when the osteoclast go to clean up, it's a signal to the osteoblast to build. So they do it at the same time. If one osteon is removed from osteoclast, then another osteon is built by the blast. So just stopping the osteoclast will also negatively impact the osteoblast, which is why if you look at the um, package inserts or the side effects or the warnings of those drugs, they will say increased risk for fracture, which is the exact opposite of what you're hoping for. You want stronger, healthier bones um, but what they have found in research studies is that those osteoclasts being inhibited, it is actually causing micro cracks in the bones. So the bones can actually weaken more over time. And if you don't have that strength, um, it's more likely to then get a fracture because of all of those little micro cracks. So you do wanna do a wide variety of things with your diet and your lifestyle there's some things you can't change, like your age, you can't change, your ethnicity, you can't change, your gender, you can't change, um, but there are other things that you can do in order to help with healing up those bones.